So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alec Albright, and I'm a program associate at the Center on Global Interests. I welcome here to the few here to the National Press Club um, to our event today discussing U.S. Russia and what's going on in the Middle East. Um, of course, this is a very critical time for, for these events and issues um, with, with Syria talks going on in Geneva, and, and absolutely a critical time for um, the U.S. and Russia uh, relationship um, and, and what this means for the, the global order and, and the Middle East region moving ahead. Karun Dimirjan from uh, the Washington Post, um, who now covers um, foreign policy and national defense issues here um, on Capitol Hill, um, who's also spent time as a reporter in Moscow for the Post and also um, with the Associated Press in, in Jerusalem. Um, so she has a, a very uh, keen perspective on these, these events as well. Um, and she'll go ahead and, and introduce our, our speakers as they come. Um, and with that, I turn it over to Karun. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. Um, and so we're going to be talking about U.S. and Russia policy, and as it says in the title of the, the um, panel, the new Middle East disorder. Um, a very hot topic these days is we're trying to figure out um, between the United States and, and Russia how we're going to work together, how we don't work together, and what the implications of that are actually going to be on the ground. Um, I'm going to, since we only have about an hour, um, leave most of the talking to the very distinguished panel of experts that we've got here. And it is my great pleasure to be able to first introduce a fellow Washington Post person um, who has a far more impressive and illustrious career foreign reporting um, in out of DC than I, um, and has been has has done uh, work on the ground in the Middle East in uh, the former Soviet Union and in Europe as well. Am I leaving out any continents? <laughs> um, and is going to start us off by giving us a picture of what the stakes are right now on the ground. Um, we will get to talking about all of these different elements of, you know, Russia's stance in history and what the U.S. objectives are. But let's just start off, since we are talking about the implications in the Middle East, about the Middle East. So I will turn it over to you. Uh, good morning, one and all. Um, I'm actually going to talk about mostly about Saudi Arabia. Um, because it's kind of central to a lot of things going on, and particularly the Levant and that part of the Middle East. And I, I will get to how Saudi Arabia and Russia and Syria all come together at the end of my talk. But um, let me start by giving you some idea. Saudi Arabia has, as you may have been reading, has, has a new leadership, and everybody's talking about this new activism on the part of the Saudi Arabia. Uh, since they went into <coughs> Yemen, started a war there last <coughs> March. Um, they've been much more active on the international and Arab scene. Uh, but in fact, this activism started with the Arab Spring. And um, the Saudis, believe it or not, were crucial in getting first the Gulf Cooperation Council and then the Arab League to get the United Nations to pass a resolution uh, uh, authorizing the use of force in Libya in order to get rid of uh, Gaddafi. The Saudis were absolute, and that's where their activism starts. And other than getting rid of um, Gaddafi, their second priority was Syria. Uh, Abdullah had a feud with, with Assad. This is Abdullah the late king who died just about a year ago. He had a personal feud with Assad, and he was quite determined to see Assad overthrown. And I was trying to date when he started this, and I happened to find this issue of the Saudi foreign, foreign, uh, uh, their, their, uh, foreign, their foreign affairs uh, think tank. And this is September 2011. And Abdullah is telling Assad, you got to go. So the activism we're seeing today is really based, starts back in 2011 with King Abdullah and then has been accelerated under King Salman. Um, right now the Saudis, as you know, have formed a coalition of uh, nine Arab countries to try and reverse um, the Houthi takeover of power in Yemen. This is the Saudis' first coming out as a military power. And the reason um, they are doing this is not just Iran. It's because the Saudis, in the wake of 
the um, Arab Spring, saw the collapse of power in the three traditional uh, power centers of, of the Middle East, Baghdad, Damascus, and Cairo. They saw a vacuum, and they wanted to prove and show that they could also be a military power in addition to being the center of Islam, the uh, largest Arab economy, and with the biggest foreign reserves, uh, the fourth largest in the world. But they've never been able to show that they had uh, any kind of military throwaway. So they have been um, using Yemen as their uh, coming out exercise <coughs> in trying to show that they can, they can effectively use military power as well as their financial and economic power. Unfortunately, it has not worked out well for them there so far, but nonetheless, that's what they're trying to do. Um, now, <clears throat> now, obviously, they are doing this partly in response to Iran coming back into um, international legitimacy, and they are convinced Iran is going to make uh, a concerted effort to extend their influence throughout the Arab world. And the Saudis are out to roll back Iranian influence in the Arab world. So they're really up against each other in a, a number of countries in the Levant and, the, and, and in the Gulf. Um, so th there is that confrontation. But what I'm trying to say is that the Saudis are really have become proactive and are determined to be the great power of the Arab world. So they're definitely on a collision course. Now, this comes together in Syria, where the Iranians are, uh, have been for a very long time backing Assad and the Assad regime, and now Russia and now the United States. So you have the three powers coming together, um, sort of increasingly so, uh, now and I think as we go in the future here. And the Saudis, I want to talk a little bit about in the remaining time, the Saudis' attitude towards Russia. The Saudis didn't recognize, no, no that's not, they restored diplomatic relations w with the Soviet Union in 1991, I think it was. It was just after, no, 1990, September 1990. They had diplomatic relations, but they had never allowed the Soviet Union to have an embassy in the country. So they call it restoring diplomatic relations. And they did it as a prid quo quo for the Soviet Union supporting a resolution at the United Nations authorizing the use of force against Saddam Hussein, who had, had, had um, gone in and occupied Kuwait. But it was a quid pro quo. And the Saudis also uh, lent the Soviet Union a billion dollars in order to convince them to support the resolution. So the Saudis and the Russians have this um, sort of on-again, off-again relationship. Now, the same goes for the sale of um, Soviet, uh, Russian arms to Saudi Arabia today. Um, the Saudis have, both under Abdullah and now under King Salman, have played with the Russians, offering or suggesting they're ready to buy Russian arms, but they're not going to do it unless the Russians back off on Assad and um, stop supporting him. So there's a lot of talk of, of arms again, of Russian arms uh, being sold to, to uh, Saudi Arabia even, even now. But this has been going on for three years. And the Saudis, I, I'm sure because I know them, they're, they're not going to do it just, for, they don't really need Russian arms. They're getting $60 billion of American arms. But they're trying to work out a trade-off uh, with the Russians. Uh, okay, you back off on Assad and we'll buy your arms. I mean, that's the kind of thing the Saudis are, uh, uh, will, will do. And um, so you'll see this, you know, while the Syrian, you have different levels of conflict over Syria, and certainly between the United States and, and Russia, but you have this game going on between uh, the United States and 
Russia over Assad and the future of, of Syria. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I should have mentioned earlier, um, I'm used to asking questions not doing introductions, uh, that David Ottaway is currently at the Wilson Center where he's working on a book about the implications of the Arab Spring and has already authored one on Saudi Arabia. So that's quite the area of his expertise. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Mark Katz. Mark Katz is a professor at George Mason University. He has, um, he is an uh, expert also on Middle East issues. He's been posted at various uh, universities in the Middle East and in Russia, I believe, if I'm not mistaken about that, that, that history. Um, he is a uh, professor of government and politics, and he is going to talk a little bit about the Russia side of this, um, to give us a little bit of the context um, both in terms of both the ge geopolitics but also the Russian thinking, I believe, because um, none of this is just a random occurrence. As, as David spoke about, um, in, in some capacities there's, there's a lot of history here, and this history goes back a very long time um, that affects how people think and act in this region. Yes, I'm going to say something about the, the, the context of, uh, the historical context of uh, Russian policy toward the Middle East, which is kind of hard to do in five minutes, so I best, best, best get on with it. Uh, since the, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, almost a century ago, Moscow has pursued two geopolitical goals in the Middle East. One has to do with its uh, anti-Western foreign policy. Uh, promoting or working with uh, those forces in the Middle East that are, are, are anti-Western. And of course, they've been anti-Western because they see the West as a military threat, but also as a, a political threat, especially in terms of just the existence of democratization. Uh, another uh, geopolitical goal that they have pursued is the prevention of indigenous trends in the Middle East from affecting the um, Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union, especially the Muslim regions. Uh, and these forces have included pan-Turkism uh, in the past, uh, Islamic fundamentalism, and of course since uh, 2011, the Arab Spring. <coughs> now what's interesting I think is that when, when you look at sort of the sweep of Moscow's policy is that sometimes they have pursued both of these goals. Sometimes they've emphasized one of, over the other, depending on sort of the strength of the threat. Uh, and sometimes they have pursued neither very vigorously. And I think it's important to start with why they have pursued neither. And, that's, and we've seen at points in time when, when Moscow has been consumed with internal political struggles, uh, with its own uh, economy, they tended not to pursue a very active policy in the Middle East. In other words, that, that after the Bolshevik Revolution, except for a very short burst of activity in the early 1920s, they were largely inactive uh, from the mid-1920s uh, up th through the 1930s. There was uh, uh, expression of interest in the Middle East during the period of the Nazi-Soviet <coughs> pact, although they didn't do an awful lot. But then once World War II started and Moscow needed the West, it did not challenge the West uh, in the Middle East at this particular time. But uh, during the Cold War, at least certainly between 1945 and 1979, this was a period in which they focused on pursuing anti-Western objectives. But events that occurred in uh, 1979 changed their calculus uh, in that we had both the uh, Iranian Revolution and then, of course, the uh, Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. And this brought to the fore once you know, very strongly uh, indigenous trends in the Middle East that were harmful toward Moscow's interest. In other words, that the revolutionary Iran represented a, a competitive revolutionary ideology, even if it wasn't that st strong with regard to the Soviet Union itself. It competed for successfully uh, the opposition uh, in the Middle East. And of course, their intervention in Afghanistan drew the opprobrium of almost the entire Muslim world. And for Moscow, sort of, it, it was, the, Afghanistan in particular was sort of the worst of all possible worlds because what happened was there, there would be sort of a, a, a uh, uh, basically an alliance between uh, the West and Muslim forces working against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And this, of course, contributed to the Soviet withdrawal. 
In the 1990s, we saw another period of inactivity uh, that, again, under Yeltsin, Moscow was consumed with its own uh, political problems, didn't play a very active role. It wasn't completely inactive, but wasn't, didn't play a terribly active role in the Middle East. But obviously, with the rise of Putin, things have changed, that once more we have seen an assertive uh, Russian foreign policy. Now, one thing I think that Moscow's policy did succeed at even in the 1990s and up through much of the Putin era, is that they, what they wanted to do, they were facing uh, Muslim unrest in the Soviet Union, in Chechnya, <laughs> other Muslim regions. What they wanted to do desperately was to prevent Chechnya from becoming a cause celebre in the Muslim world the way that Afghanistan had been. And they largely succeeded. They largely succeeded, not completely, but for the most part, the Muslim world simply wasn't interested in events in Chechnya, and the West didn't get terribly involved as, as well. Now, that didn't mean they didn't have problems, but they, those problems could have been an awful lot worse. Obviously, with the rise of, uh, and, and, if, and I think Putin, part of his, his, his policy with regard to the U.S. after 9-11 was to ensure this, in other words, that by expressing support for the U.S., in other words, that the U.S. and Russia were on the same side against the common threat of Islamic radicalism. But of course, everything changed with the U.S.-led intervention in Iraq, <coughs> with the uh, color revolutions and Putin's perception that these were American-instigated activities, and then of course with the Arab Spring in 2011, um, which uh, Moscow soon decided was, was, was also foreign-inspired, whether it was the West or whether it was Saudi Arabia that, once again, uh, that what they saw was that the possibility of uh, the West and uh, Islamist forces uh, combining to hurt Russian interests. And I think that what, what we've seen is that, uh, with regard to Russian policy towards Syria, kind of the, the logic that, that I think the, uh, Putin has tried to present to the West is that that, that, that Russia and the West are really on the same side, that uh, Islamic radicalism threatens us both, therefore the Assad regime is less worse than the alternative in Syria, uh, because there is no moderate alternative, and of course they've taken actions to make sure there's no moderate al uh, alternative, uh, but that, that, that the West and Russia should essentially be on the same side on this, and the fact that it's not is, is very frustrating, and I think that for the Russians they sort of see you know, various explanations, you know, why is the U.S. not uh, pursuing what Russia sees to be in America's interest? And, you know, maybe the explanation is simply uh, American incompetence. They're, they're always prepared to believe that or at least to assert that. Uh, the other is that maybe the U.S. Is, you know, thinks they can have it all, it can defeat the Islamists, can get rid of Assad, and install a pro-Western regime. Or maybe the, the U.S. will simply fail in that the Islamists will, will uh, succeed and that Russia will be the one that's more hurt than anybody else. So I think that in, in terms of this, in other words, that they, they, they see this, this geopolitical uh, common interests with the West that, that the West should see in Syria, but somehow the West isn't doing so, although um, you know, to, to the extent that we're cooperating with, with the Russians uh, nowadays in, the, in their peace process. Uh, I'm sure Michael will talk more about that. Now, just sort of telegraphically with regard to a few things, uh, one of the things that, that I just want to point out is that um, David mentioned Saudi Arabia and the Saudi-Russian relationship. I think that in terms of you know, talking with the Russians over the years, the one thing that really impresses me is that Russian scholars, Russian officials, Russian journalists, they have tended to look at Saudi Arabia the same way that America has tended to look at Iran, at least up until very recently. In other words, they don't regard Saudi Arabia as a conservative monarchy. They regard Saudi Arabia as an Islamic revolutionary regime that is actively seeking to spread revolution. They have, you know, they saw this with regard to they blamed the Saudis for the Chechen rebellion uh, uh, over and over. You know, during the 1990s, they they have um, you know done this recently as well. They see Saudi Arabia as behind the efforts to overthrow uh, Gaddafi and Assad. Now you might add, well then, how does this make sense in terms of they're trying to do business 
with Saudi Arabia. And it, I think this is also a, a difference between the Russian approach and the American approach. If, the America, if America doesn't like a, a government, we put sanctions on them, we don't trade with them. If Russia really fears someone, they trade with them. They try to give them an incentive to have good relations. Now you might ask, well then, what, how do you explain their imposition of sanctions on Turkey recently? The answer is quite simple. They don't fear Turkey. But they do fear Saudi Arabia. And so you see this, pro, this, this effort to somehow to, to work with it. Uh, with regard to Iran, you know, we hear an awful lot of times in the press, not of course the Washington Post, uh, that Russia and Iran are you know, allied in Syria, but of course Russia and Iran have had a very long and very difficult relationship. Everyone knows that Iran has, has a myriad, a list of complaints against the United States. The list of complaints that Iranians have against Russia is far longer and far older. Uh, and that the Iranian press refers to all of these things virtually every day in articles discussing Russia. They don't trust the Russians at all. Uh, and so this is really an alliance of convenience because, in fact, their relations are, are basically competitive. One has to keep that, that in mind. And I think that, that, that the way the, that, that it's seen is, is that, um, you know, in one sense, you know, the sort of you know, obviously the U.S. is not happy that the Saudis are talking to the Russians at all, or seem to be cooperating with them. But I think the Saudi attitude is that if they can make even any kind of deal with the Russians, this will isolate the Iranians, which of course is their real goal. Uh, with regard to Syria, I just want to say that uh, Syria has ha is important, has been important to Russia. The British National Archives this past fall released a fascinating document, a memo to uh, Prime Minister <coughs> Macmillan, I believe it was, in the mid-1950s, in which uh, it was predicted by British intelligence that if uh, the West was seen as trying to change the government in Damascus, that Russia, Moscow would react by sending air force uh, units to, to Syria. Really quite interesting indeed. That being said though, I think it's also important to note that even at the height of their relationship during the Cold War, the Moscow-Damascus relationship is also one that's been fraught with difficulty. And that, uh, you know, and, and Assad, whether father or son, is not above playing off Moscow and Tehran in particular. They like the idea of having two, um, of two patrons to play off against each other. So it'd be very difficult uh, for one to sell out the other uh, without, you know, both cooperating, which they, they basically won't. So what I'm trying to point out is that, is that um, is sort of Putin kind of, uh, unlike the Soviet Union, which was you know, a revolutionary power, I think Putin is in many respects the arch conservative. That his outlook is more like that of czarist Russia than anything else. Uh, and that they see both the Saudis and the Americans as forces for change, which will, can and will harm Russian interests. And they're desperate to try to work with you know, either party uh, against this. But as we've seen, uh, their, their success has been quite limited. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> from Michael Kaufman, um, who is right now a f uh, fellow at the Kennan Institute. And also, he's an analyst for CNA regularly. He is, um, his expertise is in the field of military affairs. He has been an advisor on these issues concerning Eurasia and worked with the Defense Department. Um, he uh, is going to be talking about where kind of the, these two, these two contextual analyses that you've been hearing about do hit each other, where the rubber hits the road right now um, in Syria, because that is where this is all playing out most acutely at this point in time. So, um, I'll let Thank you, you Carl. leave you to it. Yeah. Um, <coughs> okay, Mark, save me some time my presentation, but let me pick up where you left off a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, modern-day Russian policy in the Middle East and, of course, focus more on Syria. I think that's what many of you came to hear about. Uh, first, I want to start off kind of with our panel title. So when you think about, from my view, when you think about the new Middle East disorder, all right, for me, the structural way to look at the defining element of this disorder is not sort of the migrating of U.S.-Russia confrontation or contest south to the Middle East, and it's not even the Arab-Israeli conflict today. It's fundamentally the Shia-Sunni divide and a contest that's playing out between Saudi Arabia and 
and Iran across several conflicts and war zones in the Middle East, right? And to me, this is probably the more important sort of defining aspect, element of the region. Uh, when I look sort of at Russia's modern role in the Middle East, um, you know, I think by and large, Russia has been happy to have any role at all, first and foremost. So if you look at Russia's approach to the Middle East after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, by and large, this approach was based on getting what access they could and maintain what role they could. And the two things Russia traditionally can offer to countries is arms sales and nuclear energy. These are two things Russia can successfully trade in. But because of Russia's position, this is not the approach of the Soviet Union. There's no military assistance. There's no any other kind of assistance. This is the sale of things for money. And by that policy has not changed very much today either. In fact, it's remained the same. Uh, when you're dealing with Russia, ultimately you're dealing with uh, arms sales and you're dealing with nuclear energy. Uh, where Russia has been particularly successful, uh, as Dave was talking about, as a result of the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring changed quite a bit for Russia. It created a whole new opportunity. It basically took what was a very frozen, structured board where the U.S. and the West dominate in the Middle East and it created a great deal of opportunities because various Arab states uh, not only were put in flux, but they were very quickly looking to deleverage. They had found themselves solely dependent on their alliance with the United States uh, for military arms sales and a range of political support, and they were looking for any alternative actor they could find that would not have these sort of conditions in this approach. And so a lot of countries, even though it did not make much military sense, began to look at Russia for the prospect of arms sales, Egypt, uh, Iraq, uh, a whole range of countries began to try to deleverage from the United States with their dependency on the West, because they essentially began to see U.S. policy as U.S. being a fair weather friend, fair weather friend, the U.S. both liked their regime, but at the same time, the U.S. was quite comfortable with them being overthrown by a popular democratic movement. And this, of course, Russia took what opportunity it could, again, for money. Um, and even when we turn to Syria, which I will, and that's primarily what I want to talk about, uh, if you look at Syria, the bulk of what Russia had been doing in Syria up until uh, September of last year has not been Soviet-style military assistance. All right? Much of uh, the military hardware that Russia has been giving to Syria for the last four years was sold for money. And if you ask, well, where did that money come from? That's a very good question. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit, because the, the Syrian conflict, of course, has a number of actors in it, uh, some very prominent and seen, and others less so. Uh, when I turned to Syria, you know, first and foremost, Russia's position on Syria has been absolutely consistent. In fact, we've kind of arrived at this point four and a half years down the line from two very consistent American and Russian positions, right? U.S. position was that the opportunity cost of getting involved in the Syrian conflict was always higher than the opportunity. And as a result of that, the U.S. president sought to keep the United States out of a direct military involvement in Syria uh, at any cost, right? And the Russian position was also very consistent and quite the opposite, which was Russia believes first and foremost that the Syrian regime not necessarily led by Assad, by the way, in my opinion, but the Syrian regime represents both the only legitimate and the only viable actor in that country, that any overthrow or defeat of the Syrian regime will result in either a Libya scenario today or what you had in Afghanistan in the 1990s, uh, the civil war there, um, and that uh, it's completely unrealistic to advance any other sort of uh, anti-Assad, secular, moderate <laughs> opposition because that opposition doesn't stand a chance against forces like the Islamic State or Jabal al-Nusra. Uh, and that ultimately, even if they were to win, right, uh, just like the Taliban in the 1990s then quickly took over and won, that would be the likely result. Uh, second, you know, when you look at it sort of from a global perspective, uh, Russia very much shows Syria to be the place where we draw the line, and it would draw the line on Syria at, uh, with respect to regime change, right? It's quite interesting because uh, Russia's take on Syria is a bit different. Syria, to me, is fundamentally, first and foremost, uh, primarily a conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, all right? Uh, United States and Russia are involved, but they are, when you think about it, the, in our news, they are the principal actors. But the source of this conflict and what's really kept it going for four and a half years is you have Saudi Arabia, Gulf states, Turkey on one side, you have Iran, Hezbollah uh, on the other side, and uh, this is probably also where the principal dispute is over Assad state as well. Um, you know, my Kind of takeaway, and this is a very contestable arguable, uh, arguable point I'll make for you, is that uh, I think if you look at Syria today, you see very two clear distinct wars, right? One to the east against the Islamic State, being waged by the United States, its coalition, Iraqi forces, Syrian Kurds on the ground. An entirely largely separate conflict taking place in the same domain between Assad, Russia, Iran, Hezbollah support, and a whole range of forces, uh, domestic and proxy forces arrayed against them, right? And that in both of these conflicts, both of these wars today, 
uh, you see both the United States making meaningful progress on the ground against the Islamic State, uh, iterative but meaningful, and you also see Russia making meaningful progress against Assad's enemies on the ground, another confrontation. Uh, there, I think you find quite interesting, going into the holidays sort of in December, we had in D.C. kind of a general narrative, and I think this narrative was originally born out of the narrative that started when Russia first began the intervention in September, that this is by de fact, default will be a quagmire for Russia, Russia can't hope to make any military gains, won't be successful, a largely premise sort of, you know, the, a little bit, no one could possibly succeed in the Middle East if the U.S. has not been successful there militarily to, to achieve political ends. And that narrative carried through as you were going into the holidays, and then coming out of the holidays here in January, uh, I think we've all sobered up a little bit, and suddenly we are beginning to see a clear narrative that Russia is indeed making military gains that are politically meaningful in this conflict, right? If you look at Russia's objectives behind the intervention, this was not a great opportunity for Russia. Russia did this with Iran at the last minute because Assad was going to fall, meaning Russia had tried everything else to sustain the Syrian regime. And at various points, the Syrian regime was successful in this conflict, but it was clearly going to fail, and this was the last moment to save it, one. Uh, two, Russia's intent was basically to use force in order to achieve political ends, change facts on the ground sufficiently so as to start this process of political settlement. Three, uh, if you look at where some of the money has come into Syria, it's come from Iran, but it's also come from China, all right? Uh, and, and you're going to say, why are these countries, you know, why would a country like China be interested in Syria? For, you know, from a global perspective, it is very much interested in preventing a regime uh, change effort by the United States. Um, as this military conflict unfolded, initially did not look the first couple months that Russia was going to be successful and that it could achieve significant change. But it very quickly launched this parallel effort, the Vienna process, that's now going to lead us to, lead us to Geneva III. Um, if you look at the entire process and the purpose of this effort by Russia, uh, first and foremost, it has gotten the United States and the West, by and large, to agree to a fairly lengthy process, okay? at which Assad's fate will be determined sometime down the line, but beyond the time span of uh, the U.S. administration, one. Uh, two, it's essentially a very informal process of talk while you fight, and uh, this, I think, is probably the only, the only approach that could have been successful in Syria because they tried earlier in Geneva, too, having, creating delegations and having them meet directly with the Syrian government, and that was not going to go anywhere. However, this process of talk where you fight very strongly favors sort of Russia's and Iran's strategy, and that strategy is essentially Okay, if we talk while we fight, we will steadily be eliminating okay, the Syrian opposition and moderate rebel groups, and that process will take place by taking towns, by forcing various groups to sign ceasefires, which has been happening, losing ground, assassinating various rebel leaders, which is a bit of a hark back to the Second Chechen War. And as a, real, as a result of this, as we march down this talk while you fight road, what is really the Syrian moderate opposition is steadily disappearing and dwindling, one. Uh, Russia's negotiating hand and Assad's negotiating hand is being strengthened on a week-by-week -week basis, in my opinion. Uh, it's two. Uh, three, you know, Saudi and Turkish recalcitrance is basically driving a wedge in some respects from the U.S. position on this conflict, right? So the U.S. is much more, the U.S. is more interested in some sort of political settlement, or at least a ceasefire that freezes the loss of life in Syria, then it is interested in Assad's immediate fate, right? Um, and Russia shares this position, and Saudi Arabia and Turkey do not, right? You can see this play out. Uh, going into these uh, latest negotiations, you saw a lot of jockeying, and the Russian approach was essentially, uh, first and foremost, to try to insert various kind of groups uh, that would be pro-Russian or pro-Assad into the negotiations. Saudi Arabia in Riyadh structured uh, this high negotiations committee that will present a lot of the opposition groups. But the, the real story here is that steadily the modern Syrian opposition rebels are losing ground in Syria in various areas. And over time, you will see the position of Russia only increase, but you see a very changing uh, role of Russia in this relationship with Turkey. Um, a while ago, when the incident with the Su-24 happened, I kind of quipped that, uh, that Su-24 that was shot down may someday be remembered as the father of the Kurdish nation. And the reality is that today the Kurds are the only group in Syria that are both receiving military assistance and political support from the United States and Russia. And that's only as of this month, and there's a very distinct reason for that. 
I think you, I think one big change that you will see in Russia's position in the last month and a half is Russian support for the Kurds. Uh, with that, I'm going to wind up and uh, save some time for my other colleague, Jean. Um, Jean Francois Sesnik, who um, as he says, wears many hats. Um, he teaches at Georgetown's Business School right now. Um, he also uh, is, sorry, a managing partner of the Lafayette Group, and he is an expert in how more, well, we've been talking a lot about politics um, and alliances, and he's going to bring us to a very pragmatic issue, finances, oil, things that, you know, that, that um, you can't ha have all this happen if you can't pay for it, basically. So, so give us um, the, the perspective of how these elements play into it, and also what that means for the outlook of um, these conflicts, these alliances, these uh, this, these stakes going forward. Um, of course, it's very difficult because there are so many variables and so many uh, priorities in the in the Gulf by all these countries. But I want to a uh, little bit like David. I want to focus a little bit on Saudi Arabia in this case. And uh, in terms of, of uh, scenarios, I think with, uh, with Saudi Arabia today, I can see a rosy scenario and a not quite so rosy scenario. And of course, uh, no one has ever lost a job being negative about the Middle East, so I probably will emphasize the, uh, the, 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 the difficult scenario. But um, I, I think fundamentally today, I think what Saudi Arabia has to decide is who the enemy is. And in Syria, it's either Islamic State or it's Iran. And both uh, points have been brought here today, and I think the Saudis at this point have chosen Iran. But uh, the problem with that is that it makes Saudi Arabia quite uh, isolated on the, in the world, because I think basically the United States, Russia, Iran, would like uh, Saudi Arabia to work with them to focus on ISIS and, or Islamic State and not on Iran per se. If the Saudis were seeing the light, so to speak, um, then of course we would have some major changes on the ground. The Saudis could get involved on the ground in Syria. And although they haven't been terribly successful in Yemen, so I'm not sure it would make much difference, but with other people, and the Turks in particular, that could really make a big difference. The, uh, this, I'm not sure, is likely this uh, sort of uh, change of heart of the Saudis, I think, is not likely to happen in the very near future. I think Saudi Arabia really does not see Islamic State as its problem or as its enemy. And this is where we have a major, major difference between U.S. policy and Saudi policy. The, um, the Islamic State uh, for the Saudis can be handled. However, Iran cannot be handled. And therefore, they will continue to support all these subgroups and many, many groups. Apparently somebody told me at a, at a conference not too long ago there were 1,500 groups in Syria fighting against many, each other mostly, but also fighting against ISIS or fighting against Assad. <coughs> the Saudis want to defeat Assad and the Alawis in Syria. Why? Because they want to defeat Iran. And at this point they see that as being the, the same thing. Iran equals Assad. Now, where I a little bit disagree with David is that I think this was started, of course, under Abdullah, King Abdullah, but Abdullah was very, very keen to work with the Syrians for years and years and years. He even married a Syrian wife at one point who had some, some kind of family connection with Assad. So they can work together, and Abdullah for years was paying off the Assads until, until the problems in Lebanon and the assassination of Hariri and the, that where Abdullah felt he had been betrayed. But uh, I think the uh, where I, I I think the Saudis, if they change their policy towards Assad today, they could do it. I think they have it within themselves to do it. But it is not happening because I think, and I'm not sure 100 percent of that. I'm really working on this right now. Is I'm wondering whether, to which extent, this is not reflective of a split in the royal family at the highest level of leadership in between uh, in between certain princes to decide who is a member of the who is the enemy. I would say that King Salman and his son Mohammed bin Salman are probably on the side 
of saying Islamic uh, uh, Assad is the enemy, Iran is the enemy. <coughs> but on the other side, we'd have Mohammed bin Nayef would be more likely to see Islamic <coughs> State uh, as, as the enemy, and in that being very close to the Americans, and much closer to the Americans than the other two. So I'm not sure we're going to see much changes at this time, which is a problem, because now we're in a game of chicken <laughs> between the US and the Saudi leadership on who is going to give in first. Will King Salman and Mohammed bin Salman give in on Iran and decide to work with Iran? Iran's not helping. <laughs> the, uh, the Republican guards have very, very strong statement on against the Saudis. The, uh, we, we see that even from uh, the U.S. point of view that the, the Republican guards and all the very conservative elements are <coughs> making sure there will be no liberals in government in the near future in Iran. So they're not helping in that situation. So the, the, the scenario, in my view, at this point is fairly negative because I see the Saudis continuing to support all these minor groups and basically fomenting and continuing the civil war in Syria at the cost of not having any peace talks for the time being. Now, on this uh, negative side, let me bring oil where I'm more positive. <laughs> and uh, interestingly enough, as you have seen in the past week or so, there has been some talks uh, in, in the press, and not only in the press, but everywhere else about Russia and Saudi Arabia getting together to uh, maybe talk about cutting production. Now, that those talks have happened for at least a year and a half right now. And the Saudis have been talking to the Russians, and the Russians have been talking to the Saudis, although both deny it. Uh, but the fact is, it has happened. And I think uh, the Saudis willingly have kept the price of oil down by increasing production, and they still have the capacity to increase production further, should it be necessary. This is not all bad for the Saudis because they have, to this day, they have about close to s between 600 and 800 billion dollars, depends how you count this, uh, of, of cash they can actually uh, outlay for, for, for their efforts and continue to develop their economy, which is uh, still growing pretty quickly. Uh, so they can, they can really take a lot of pressure. And the Russians are realizing that it is very difficult. They, we've already succeeded in getting less investments in the shale oil in the United States. So therefore, it means that the, there is less production in the future. The production hasn't changed that much in the US, but it will decline as the investments do not take place. And the Russians could really start deciding to cut production, just like they did in 1999. In 1999, they didn't cut production. They said they would cut production, which is quite different. But the markets interpreted it that way, and the price of oil doubled. The Saudis matched at that time by half a million barrels, and I think we are about to see these kind of things. Now, I've said that six months ago, saying the price would go up to 80, and I was not quite right. But uh, nevertheless, uh, this I think uh, the thing is that f the, the links between the oil policy and the policies in Syria is just not there. It's money. They're really, it's a question of controls of a market. And they, of course, it would be nice if the Russians and the Saudis could get along on the Syrian issues, on all manners of other issues. But the fact is, they can work on the oil issues, and it's somewhat independent, actually. So I, I, I believe that we will see the OPEC, in particular, but mostly Saudi Arabia within OPEC, uh, start dealing with the Russians, and uh, we, we will see that the Russians will perhaps not officially announce it, but start declining production by half a million barrels a day, and the Saudis matching that. So we'll see the overhang in the market basically disappear, which will hopefully bring the prices up a little bit somewhat. I'm not sure the Saudis want it over 80. I think everybody will be happy at 60 for the time being, but that, that we will see in the very near future. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just to start out, I mean, we've been talking about um, the, 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 the power players in this scenario quite a bit, and especially putting a big, big focus on Saudi Arabia. Um, we haven't talked that much about the United States and where all of these different, um, uh, where the points of conflict are. So I was wondering if we, if you guys could tell me a little bit about um, basically who who has the most staying power and who has the most influence in this sort of scenario, especially when you're talking about 
Saudi Arabia and Iran, the United States and Russia all meeting each other in this one place. Um, because various, various members of you talked about shifting alliances and about interests that don't necessarily match up with what their traditional allies are supposed to be. So I'm wondering um, if these points of disagreement um, matter, um, if they matter for what's going to happen on the ground, and you know, do, th do the fact that they exist, is that a good thing or a bad thing, I guess? Saudis in Syria are supporting Islamic groups that they regard as nationalist, Syrian, and um, uh, 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 actually against ISIS. So you're going to have both the groups that Saudi Arabia is supporting and ISIS uh, with no interest in a ceasefire or in a, in a settlement even if you get some progress in Geneva. So you're going to, the question is, are the Saudis going to back off on, um, on, on uh, supporting the groups they've been supporting? They are su supporting the, the Free Syrian Army, which is who are our boys. And there's been something very interesting going on. The Saudis have been providing anti-tank missiles to um, certain groups that have been very effective even in holding off uh, sort of the pro-government or the government offensive and, and in, uh, in the northern part of the country. And these tow missiles are coming from Saudi Arabia, but they're coming from the United States. The Saudis built, bought 14,000 anti-tank tow missiles uh, two years ago from the United States. And these missiles, in small batches, uh, last fall, something like 500 went, uh, the Saudis uh, brought in through Turkey to their, to their groups they were supporting. Now, the Americans could cut this off because the, the Saudis, this is all a CIA operation, by the way, not, not a Pentagon operation. <laughs> so the, the, Washington could cut off the, the permission for the Saudis to continue to stop doing this. But I can, what I'm saying is I can see a lot of conflict between the United States and Saudi Arabia over these negotiations going forward. Michael's popping up and down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I didn't there was a, uh, an American tow tube provided by Saudi Arabia that took out that Russian helicopter on the search and rescue mission. If you remember, when the Su-24 was shot down, Russian sent a search rescue mission, the helicopter was brought down by fire, it landed, and then the, the rebels put out a picture with a tow two they took out this helicopter. Um, I was going to say, you know, regarding the Saudi position, absolutely it is a USCIA operation funneling all these weapons, but they were very successful in holding off the sort of combined Iranian-Syrian offensive back in October when it got launched. And that was a very interesting test case because when the Russians intervened, they didn't know what they actually had for allies, and there was no real way to test it to see what was left of the Syrian army, what could the Iranians really do on the ground in, you know, uh, as a corollary to the Syrian campaign. And at first, it went very slow and didn't achieve much, uh, but steadily that meat grinder has come out into both Russia's and Syria's favor, meaning those towns they couldn't be taking in the north back in October, they are falling now one by one. They're falling fairly quickly, much faster than you would expect. There were a number of ceasefires outside of homes where groups were forced to surrender territory and retreat. And so I, I think from at least Russia and Syria's position, this is going to be a much harder and longer conflict than they may have liked. But it is one that Russia is willing to invest in as long as it sees that it's winning. And it can basically s determine you know, it's, uh, uh, how much... Uh, to invest further militarily, depending on whether it's getting what it wants in the political negotiations in Geneva, all right? Or if not, how much is getting on the ground? Thank you. I must admit, I've always thought it was much easier to understand Russian foreign policy than American foreign policy. That's something that really, <laughs> really confuses me. But I think that part of the problem that we're, we're seeing at, at this particular time is that unlike the Cold War when we had one clear overarching adversary, um, there, are now, there are now several, in other words, that, that Russia is a challenge, China is a challenge, radical Sudi, Sunni jihadism is a challenge, uh, 
and Iran, uh, many consider to be a challenge, not to mention you know, North Korea, etc. So I think part of the problem that, that we face is which do we concentrate on? And the answer isn't sort of necessarily objectively out there. It partly depends on, on forces in American domestic politics and our allies. We have lots of allies and different ones regard these different threats as you know, a greater threat than, than others. You know, we have those in Europe who see Russia as a threat. We have those in the Middle East who see either uh, Sunni jihadism or Iran as a threat. We have those in East, South and Southeast Asia who see China as a threat. So that, I think, is a problem. And of course, right now, we have a president who really prefers to you know, not be so involved. And that's obviously probably going to change. Um, one thing I just want to say about Russian foreign policy, and I think that we're now seeing a period of, of, of flux in Russia, maybe not as great as at, at the end of the Cold War, but, but much greater than, than before. And I think that one of the things that, that you know, obviously Russia can sustain this policy towards Syria so long as conditions in Russia allow it to do so. And I think that, you know, it's, it's not inevitable, but I think that the question is being discussed more and more in terms of, you know, the, the impact of low oil prices, the impact of sanctions, this can be the failure of Putin to develop and modernize the economy in Russia, the bizarre um, uh, sort of deference he's paying to uh, Kadyrov, the, the Chechen strongman, and the resentment this is posing in the Russian security services. So, in other words, we, we may be getting to a point where, where it's sort of independent of what, what's going on in the Middle East, that Russia may once again become consumed with its own internal problems. A couple of, I mean, they're not small points, but they'll be short. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated right now by the role of Turkey in the, in the Syrian issue because we see that Turkey uh, is uh, basically supposedly on the side of the Saudis and uh, in many ways of the U.S. But then again, uh, we also see that uh, they are totally opposed to the Kurdish, uh, uh, the Kurdish groups in Syria, while uh, the um, while the, these uh, groups are supported by the U.S. and Russia. So the Turks are playing a double game here, and it's a very dangerous double game because this, uh, the, the, it stops the border to be made safe, as far as I can tell. So that's one of the issues I'm really puzzled by. And uh, another thing that came up in the last week or so was President uh, Xi's visit to the region. I think it was very important. Uh, the Chinese have been working on this for at least a year and a half on this visit. Uh, in uh, just to make to a very very short summary of this, I think the visit in Saudi Arabia was a disaster, and I think the visit in Iran was a great success for the Chinese. That is, and um, I think that again is a mistake in my view from the Saudi uh, on, on Saudi Arabia's side, uh, the uh, because it means that uh, Saudi is going to be even more isolated on its approach, uh, on its uh, stance today, than it even more so than it, it is already. So, I have one other short question, and I know that everyone has tons of expertise that they want to share, but I'd ask that the answers to this one be kept rather pithy, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, everybody, we're talking great game politics, basically, I mean, in, in, in a new context, but we keep talking about these, these major powers and the influence that they have and, and what role that they might play. Short of, uh, on the ground though, is there anything that um, can happen or anybody that can do anything that is not a big player with a big army, any big, you know, seat at the UN, et cetera, to actually change the stakes of things short of, you know, becoming the next ISIS terrorist group? I'm just wondering if, if that's, you know, if there is anything or if it's basically like, no, not at all. You mean coming out of left field suddenly? I mean, we talked about there's 1,500 groups on the ground, there's poor organization, but, sorry. There, we talked about, you know, there's 1,500 groups on the ground, there's poor organization, but we, we also talk about, you know, why are we getting involved? Because it's, you know, trying to make things better, trying to help self-representation. All the elements of the Arab Spring that seems to have, kind of have dissipated and, and, and disappeared a little bit over time. I guess I'm just wondering, is, is that period past that a local group or a local actor could actually be a game changer in this and do we have to stay focused on these big powers in order to be able to say you know anything would move in the region or is there an, a way for 
you know, something else to come in or someone else to come in that would actually change the way this goes forward and the way that we're gaming it out beyond the Russias and the United States and the Chinas and the Turkeys, et cetera. Well, from my mind, uh, we have an incredible number of non-state actors in Syria. We have, you know, we have ISIS, we have Jabhat al-Nusra, we have the, you know, the sort of moderates, what's left of them. Um, and you have groups that the Saudis are supporting um, that are sort of Syrian nationalist uh, groups that want an Islamic State in the end, which we certainly don't. So uh, to me, they're all, they're, <laughs> I said, the problem of having any peace agreement in Syria is that there are so many non-state actors that could upset whatever agreement is reached. So I think the whole area is just full of non-state actors. I mean, ISIS now has um, eight affiliates. I think three or four are in the Arab world. <coughs> Even if they are defeated in, um, in Syria and Iraq, they have a fallback plan that they're putting into operation, so then they could cause trouble. So I just see, <laughs> I see the landscape just crowded with non-state actors that could upset any agreement by the great powers. Um, just back up David points to say, I, I think the Islamic State still gets an important vote, right? And the Paris attacks last year showed us that the Islamic State could change its role, could change, uh, act like a major international terrorist organization like Al Qaeda did, that brought the French very quickly, more forcefully into the conflict. And it's hard to predict what the Islamic State will do this year in response to losing terrain and losing ground, right? As U.S. and U.S. allies, uh, chip away at it, right? I think it's going to become a much more serious international terrorist uh, organization in response. <laughs> Just <clears throat> very quickly, yeah, I, I, I think um, if, if we gave the impression that the major powers are, are in control, I think that, uh, you know, they're obviously not. And I agree with Michael that, uh, you know, Russian-American agreement simply won't solve things in Syria. Maybe a Russian-American agreement could could solve things in Ukraine, I don't know, but that it, it couldn't do so in Syria. That that will require some kind of, um, you know, Saudi-Iranian uh, compromise. And even then that might not work. That. Uh, um, you know, what, I think what we have now close to in, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, perhaps elsewhere, is, is Thomas Hobbes's war of all against all, and, and, and you know, who, how, how, do you, how do you resolve that? I just don't know. Uh, just uh, to finish on, to, uh, I, I'm, I'm maybe not quite as pessimistic as I sound or that uh, my colleagues sound here, but I think if Saudi Arabia decides to, to see the light, as I said before, and uh, agrees to sort of make a compromise with Iran on who's going to dominate the region, then we'd have enough powers between the big powers and the medium-sized powers like Iran and Saudi Arabia. I think we'd have enough pressure to bring some kind of a peace settlement in Syria. It, may, it will not be to the liking of many, and it will not be nice, and it will not be democratic, but it can happen. Like it still depends in large part on sponsorship. Anyway, um, do any of you have questions that you want to put to our panelists? There are many hands that went up. Okay, um, I'll start. You're the first hand that I saw, so can you just state your name? And, uh, <coughs> I'm Lawrence Carew from International Energy Partnership. Uh, a basic, common, um, well thought, non well thought question, but ISIL, what do they want? And why doesn't the other Muslim world leaders? get to them and kick their ass? Um, well, I mean, to me, I think the easiest answer is to answer, what does ISIL want, right? It wants a, an Islamic caliphate across as much of the Middle East as it can get its hands on. That's one. Uh, why don't the Arab states uh, come after it? For well, two reasons. One, first of all, uh, there's quite a few Arab states that are far less interested in fighting ISIL than they are in fighting the other war in Syria I described, getting around Assad. Second, most of them have materially dropped out of the U.S. coalition to go fight in Yemen, where they're also not winning. One of the things that didn't get said here that I'd like to mention is that realistically today, Saudi Arabia is losing both wars, one in Yemen, another one in Syria. Last year, Saudi Arabia was losing in Yemen and winning in Syria, okay, until the Russian intervention. And now Saudi Arabia is losing in Syria and in Yemen. And if you look at where where does the U.S. provide sort of various refueling, targeting, and other coalition support to Saudi forces and UAE forces and whatever? That's the campaign against Yemen. They're not flying against Syria, right? Syria is almost entirely a Western coalition today. 
So that's a short answer for you. There's other wars going on in the Middle East, and uh, Saudi Arabia and Gulf states are not winning that war either. Peter Humphrey, intelligence analyst, uh, former diplomat. Um, Russians uh, don't make a lot of babies, and Russian Muslims do make a lot of babies, and there's been about three demographic studies uh, pointing out that by 2050, Russia is a Sunni country, a majority Sunni country. And already, uh, half the military recruits are Muslim. So how sustainable is it to send Sunni uh, forces, uh, Russian forces, against uh, Alawis, Shia, Alawi uh, forces? Uh, that, when, when does that cause heartburn in the, in the, in the Russian Republic? And may I also ask, uh, how many uh, Russian soldiers will die before um, Russian mothers start marching in uh, Red Square to defend this idiot? Uh, well, I guess, I guess sort of the, the short answer is that uh, you know, we've seen minority regimes uh, last for quite a long time. And so I, I would imagine that you know, if, in fact, this, this occurs, as you indicated, that, that Moscow's rule will they'll be able to enforce their rule for, for some time. In terms of uh, the number of casualties, what we've seen so far is that the Russians have not sent ground forces, and the, Putin has indicated that he doesn't want to do so. Now, there's been talk about volunteers going, you know, Kadyrov wants to send his Chechens, uh, etc. But I think, that, um, I think that Putin understands that this is something that, that large-scale casualties uh, is something that will cause him domestic problems, and, and that and that so far he doesn't need to. In other words, he doesn't need to actually um, vanquish Assad's opponents. In other words, all he really needs is for Assad to survive in the key regions of Syria. That's good enough. And if they can make certain gains, that's also good enough. So I don't I don't see this um, uh, this is as, as ballooning. Now maybe it, it, it could at some point, but but I don't see it as uh, as terrible problem for them right now. At this point, I don't think that the body count for the soldiers is as high as the body count for the civilians. I mean, 200 and something Russians already, you know, were killed in this general cause. And um, that, I think, is very powerful for, for, it was very personal for a lot of people in Russia to feel like they actually got personally hit by something like this in a way that Paris was for Europeans or 9-11 was for the Americans. Add that to the fact that the Russians in general have a great capacity to keep up a military cause when you think other people would crap out earlier. And, and it's, it's an interesting calculus. And there definitely is a line, um, just because I was in U Ukraine and Russia when the you know, the, the, the troops that they didn't admit to having, you know, were, were cropping up all over the place. And it's interesting how sensitive the Kremlin is to that because there was a moment at which, you know, the soldiers' mothers started to get agitated as they realized that these paratroopers are our sons. You know, what are they doing in Ukraine? It's not an accident. I know my kid. Within two weeks, there was that first peace deal in Minsk. And I don't know, I can't say that one led to the other, but, you know, it's, it, it's a very conscious Kremlin about what's happening, and they seem to have a very good sense of when, how far to put, oh, not long-term planning of how far to push, but when to cut it off just so that you don't push it over the edge. So I don't know where that line is, but I don't think we've hit it because so many Russians did um, par die in that um, plane crash. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so first I would say, I wrote a bit about this in a piece from War on the Rocks in December where I basically said that, uh, you know, be very careful with the demographic determinism argument on Russia planning things out to yeah. 2050. Okay, um, well, John was calling time back there. I guess we have to run. But yeah, <laughs> to say, uh, I'll, I'll summarize my little complaint. That and my last point is, even if half of Russia is Muslim, I mean, the history of modern and contemporary and classical world does not teach us that Muslims will not go fighting Muslims in the Middle East. But not on behalf of Shia. No, I, may I make one more small point on that? I think this whole notion of Shia versus Sunni is vastly exaggerated and totally wrong. There is absolutely nothing that says that the Shiite cannot work with Sunnis in order to fight other Sunnis. I think this is just, it's used, you know, this the definition of Sunni Shia is used by the various leaderships for their own purpose, but they whip up the sectarian issues, they can whip them down, so to speak. So uh, just the same in Saudi Arabia, at one point they were, the Shias and the Sunnis were trying to work together, now there's some opposition. 
because of Iran and so on. I, I think we don't want to overemphasize this. I think this can go either way. So I'm not so worried about the Sunni Russians working with Alawis in order to fight Islamic State. Sorry to basically push us over the time limit, um, which I didn't realize was so hard and fast. But thank you all for coming very much. I think probably our experts are going to be around a little bit if you have any burning questions to try to grab them at the table. Um, I think I, sorry for just volunteering you like that. But um, thank you very much for coming out um, to be part of this discussion. Group CGI, thanks to all the panelists and to Karun especially. So please, round of applause. Thank you.